For those that are just joining us, the time of the judges was a dark time. It began after the death of the great Israelite general, Joshua. And it was said of those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit, Judges 21, 25. Also in 1 Samuel 3, 1, in those days the word of the Lord was rare and there were not many visions. There were not many dreams. How sad it is that those days are these days. Now, if you remember, last week we talked about Gideon and how, though humble and even cowardice to some extent, God said he would give him the victory if he would simply go in the strength that he had. And we find that when he called out the people of God, 32,000 men came to his side to oppose an army of 135,000. And God said, Gideon, you've got way too many guys right here because it won't be certain that this is my victory. And he says, you just tell anybody that's afraid just to go on home. And 22,000 left, leaving only 10,000. And once more, the Lord came to Gideon and says, listen, you've still got too many people. I want everybody to know this is all about me. He says, you take them down to the river and... Then test them. Those that laugh like a dog, send them away. Those that take their hand because they're ready for battle and that's how they get their water, you take those men. Only 300 were left. And so Gideon and the 300 take on the 135,000 Midianites. The odds, 450 to 1, just like the Lord likes it. Amen, church? And, of course, there was an incredible, incredible victory. And now we pick up in chapter 8 after the victory. Verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you've saved us out of the hand of Midian. But Gideon told him, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Right here, they wanted to make Gideon king. They want his son to be king after him. And then his grandson, he says, no, 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 no. That's not what it's all about. God needs to be our king. Now, a lot of people think at this point that Gideon totally stepped back from the leadership there in Israel. And that's just not the case. He does remain judge. So he's, so to speak, the secular head of state as well as the spiritual head of state as the judge of Israel. We read this in verse 24. And he said, I, I, I do have one request, that did you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was a custom of the Israelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, well, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each man threw a ring from his plunder into it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels. That's 43 pounds, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on the camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephah, which he placed in Orpah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. So right here we find that Gideon says, hey, I just have one request. Please give me just one earring, each of you. And, of course, they give him the earring, and it it amounts to an incredible amount of gold. And one would have to attribute at this point that Gideon still was trying his best to do the will of God. And so... Just like each man that led Israel at a different time, they had the privilege to, quote, inquire of the Lord. And, of course, under Moses, Aaron would wear the special ephod that would be able to discern what the will of God was. Well, of course, we realize now that Israel is autonomous by tribe. There's very little connection. Even the word Israel is used very loosely right here. And so the worship of of God there in the tabernacle at Shiloh is almost gone. That's in Ephraim, of course. But we know that Gideon's from the tribe of Manasseh. And so right here, Gideon says, okay, I'm going to make a gold ephod to be able to know what the Lord's will is. The sad thing is this becomes an idol to not only Gideon, but all of Israel. Read on. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land enjoyed peace for 40 years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. 
Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abrazites. No sooner had Gideon died that the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their god and did not remember the Lord their god, who had rescued them from the hands of all the enemies on every side. They also failed to show kindness to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, for all the good things he had done for them. You know, right here, we find decision by decision, Gideon begins to drift away from God. First of all, riches come into his life, and there's nothing like the temptation of riches and comfortability to begin to slowly take you away from God. This then becomes his idol versus the Lord. It became a snare not only for him, but all of Israel. And then we find that he begins to have many wives. And of course, with a worldly mindset, perhaps the women were attracted to all of his wealth. And he had many, many wives. Now, most interestingly, though, we find right there that he had a concubine who lived in Shechem. Now, Shechem, of course, is in Ephraim. And she bore him a son named Abimelech. Now, this is very interesting. I was really wrestling with the text here. And it was interesting this morning. I was reading through it, reading through it, trying to really get the full grasp of it. And I got to chapter 9 in verse 18. And it said, Abimelech, the son of Gideon's slave girl. And then it clicked. You see, the Israelites wouldn't put any other Israelite as a slave. Abimelech's mom was a Canaanite. And we'll show you a little bit later. She was a Hivite. But so we find right here now the drift in Gideon. I mean, here he was getting an incredible victory for God. Then the prosperity comes. He begins to idolize the ephod. Then he takes on many wives and even marries outside of the faith a Canaanite woman. And you know that had been expressly condemned in the book of Joshua. Yeah. And he names this young man, very curiously, Abimelech. Now, for all of us Gentiles in the crowd, it kind of goes over our heads. But the name Abimelech simply means father of a king. And so perhaps because he kind of wanted to make it up to this, his concubine, that which he couldn't provide, because she wasn't even living in the same place as Gideon, he tries to give him extra sort of measure of esteem right there. But now... He's no longer saying, no, 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 I don't want my son to be king. I don't want my grandson to be king. Now he's even given one of his kids the name, the father of a king. That's how far Gideon drifted. Now, it is very interesting, though, that the total drift in Israel does not occur until, of course, Gideon's death. And so we find the pattern once more complete that we've been studying through the book of uh, Judges in. First of all, there was disobedience. By the Israelites. Then there was the darkness. Then there was the stress. Remember how we talked about the stresses from God? If you're feeling distress in your life, it's because the Lord wants you to feel distress. Because number four, he wants you to turn to the divine. Then God sends a deliverer into your life and in the life of Israel. But then the deliverer dies and the people return to the prostitution all over again in disobedience. Amen. And that's exactly what happens here at the death of Gideon. Our first point is simply this. One decision leads to another. Here was Gideon, the mighty man of God. Prosperity and wealth come. He begins to idolize the ephod. Then he makes decision after decision that leads to the point of even marrying outside of the faith and naming his son the son of a king. Now, we have to wrestle with that ourselves. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews 2, we read this. Verse 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment... How should we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? You know, one of the things that I used to do growing on up and, and even in my college years, I'd, I'd love to go to the beach in Florida. And uh, if you go out a little bit of ways from the beach, there'd be a current out there. 
And you'd be goofing around, having a good time, and then all of a sudden, you, 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 just out of nowhere, you saw that you drifted many, many yards down the beach. And the current there is fairly harmless. But I remember one time swimming in Mexico. And I'd gotten out there, and the undertow was totally unexpectedly strong. And I started to try to swim back on in, and I couldn't. And you know, there's just this pit in my I mean, when you finally understand that something is stronger than you are, I mean, it is scary. And I start drifting out, drifting out, drifting out, and I felt like I couldn't do anything about it. Well, in time, I, I, I swam sideways, and it had a happy ending. <laughs> But, but right here, we see that Gideon began to drift one decision at a time until he gets the point of marrying outside of the faith. You know, we've got to really ask ourselves here this morning, have we drifted from our great salvation? You know, I, I want to talk, first of all, to all the people that were on the Portland mission team. I mean, it's been great what the Lord has done. The first three months. I mean, technically today is our three-month anniversary of the church. Is that awesome, guys? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, God has blessed us amazingly. I mean, 18 people baptized. 29 people restored. I mean, these people were falling away and have come back to the Lord. Over 40 people placing membership. That is incredible. But I've got to talk to you guys that were on the Portland Mission team. Have you drifted? From your passion for God, your passion for souls, and the joy that you had in that. Or have you begun small decision by small decision by small decision to drift away from the commitment that's brought you here? I'm going to talk to a lot of people that are visiting. You that are disciples. You remember the passion that you had when you were first baptized. You remember the passion that you had when you were out there taking a stand for God and baptizing people, restoring people. Look at your life. Have you drifted? Or do you even feel like I'm drifting and I just can't get back in the store? Then it's time to turn to God and to find a fellowship where you can have the Lord through discipling in one another's life. Are you with me right here, guys? You see, we've got to understand one decision leads to another. You know, the people that I love so much are Olu, Jack, and Kathy. Yeah. And uh, I thought the picture turned out pretty good in the bulletin this week. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it really is amazing. I mean, Lou Jack even just shared with us all. He says, you know, I was in a full-time ministry. God was doing incredible things through me. And then I sent out, but I never returned to that sold-out commitment. As a matter of fact, and he shared this, his favorite scripture became Ecclesiastes 10:19. Money is the answer for everything. Now that's taken a little bit out of context right there. But he took it out of context. <laughs> and that became his passion. He was a good-hearted guy that had done so much for the Lord, but decision by decision, he began to drift away from God. Until there was an overwhelming sadness that came upon his wife and his whole family. You see, if you're sad, if you're distressed, you've drifted from your commitment to God. You may not see it, but one decision at a time, just like Gideon. And that's why you're at where you're at. Let's get back to our text. We're ready for Judges. Chapter 9. Our second point. One priority that challenges everyone. Verse 1. Abimelech, son of Jeroboam, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them and all of his mother's clan, Ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you? To have all 70 of Jeroboam's son rule over you or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. Well, let's break this down a little bit. Abimelech goes to his mother's brothers. Now, who would his mother's brothers be? They're the Hivites. They're the Canaanites. How bad is it in Shechem? How bad is it in Ephraim? How bad is it in Israel at this time? The Canaanites are living right alongside the Jews. They're indistinguishable. And he says, hey, 
I need some help from my physical family to capture the hearts of everybody, both Canaanite and Jew, in Shechem. I need you guys to kind of put it out there. Which is it better? Do you want 70 guys living in Manasseh, in Orphra, to be telling you what to do? Or would you like one of your own? Me. One of a brother, a friend, someone that cares deeply for you. And so they put the word on out there. Verse 3. When the brothers repeated all this, the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. They gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith. And Abimelech used it to hire reckless adventurers who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Orpah and on one stone murdered his 70 brothers, the son of Jeroboam. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, escaped by hiding. Wow. wow. Now there's a lot right here. The word goes out and permeates all of Shechem. And interestingly enough, the Canaanite people, and how do we know it's the Canaanites? Because they take the money out of the temple of Baal. And they say, hey, take this bit of money... And Abimelech hires some guys, which would have been Canaanites, to be able to forcefully advance your cause. Now, it's kind of interesting. Reckless adventurers, the word adventurer in Hebrew can, can literally be translated boiling over. So these were hot-headed guys. Okay? Reckless, hot-headed guys were following Abimelech, the father of a king. And then the Bible says he goes all the way from Shechem and Ephraim and then goes to Ophrah, his father's hometown. And the Bible says he uses all these guys to round up his 70 brothers and literally one by one chops off their heads at one stone, one at a time. Can you imagine the people gathering around and watching and the fear they would start to have of Abimelech? Another one. That's how we gain control. By worldly lording it over people. Well, of course, we see in the Bible right here that Jotham, the youngest one, escapes. The breakdown of that is that was a real good move. <laughs> Let's talk about this one priority that challenges everyone. It is the priority of your family. That's a challenge to everybody. The Bible says to honor your father and your mother. Amen? Amen? The Bible says for the husbands to love the wives. And the wives to respect the husbands. Amen. Yeah, we could use an amen on that one. Amen right there? Amen. It says for the children to obey their parents. Amen. But the fathers not to exasperate them. Amen. These are all commands from the word of God. And they are a priority. Our family is a priority. Though sadly, over the last five years, there's been some false teaching that's entered our fellowship. The Bible says to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. The word has seemingly gone out that a disciple's priorities need to be God, his family, the church, and his job and in leadership. So many people bought into that. And yet, the Bible says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. God and his church. Now, kingdom means more than just the church. But God and his church is the first priority, then your family, then your job, and then any kind of church leadership. You see, what had happened right here is very interesting. Abimelech had chosen his fleshly family to be that which he'd be closest to. The spiritual family of Israel, Gideon and his sons, he annihilates. See, you've got to understand, you have to have a clear priority between your spiritual family and your physical family. You know, one of the the families that I think has just uh, inspired all of us is the Anakeas. Amen, church? Oh, yeah. 
And uh, when Robin Burgundy had done great things for God, I mean, they led the AMS ministry over in Honolulu. But they came on over here, and decision by decision, they drifted away to the point that they fell away. And then they saw there were some challenges happening in their son. They go, oh, man, we've got to get with it. And so when they heard about the start of the City of Angels Church, they came coming. And after a few studies, they both got restored. And then two weeks later, Darian got baptized. Is that awesome right there? Well, you know what? You know, what's, you know that, that story can be repeated time after time. The McGee's, they place membership, they get restored, and then Jared gets baptized. Amen? Amen. Well, you know, we have another exciting kind of Kingdom Kids story. Uh, Lou Jack, I believe, had invited out Elaine and Terrence to church. And they dragged along Elaine's son, Kenny. Well, Kenny came, and today, Kenny's getting baptized into Christ. Is that awesome? And, of course... He'll be able to help Terrence and Elaine get it all together too. Amen? <laughs> See, w- w- we need to understand that when we get our priorities right, when we put God first, then our family is going to be blessed. Amen. Somehow it's been put into us. So if we put God first, our family's going to be messed up. No, your family's going to be messed up if you make that your idol. Right. That's how you mess up your family. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6. In Luke 6, it's a a, a powerful scripture about spiritual family. It says in verse 32, this is Jesus talking. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. You know, it occurs to me that church is growing so fast, and that is simply by the blessing of God. Amen? Amen. And we have all these different backgrounds. There's the mission team coming down from Portland. There's all the remnant people that have come in that have moved clear across country like the Zindlers and said, oh yeah, we want to be a part of this thing. Uh, There are people in L.A. who said, listen, I've drifted, drifted, drifted. I still have my relationship with God, but I really need to repent and get back my first love. And we have all these people coming together, and in some ways, we're just kind of getting to know each other as family. But there can be kind of a human tendency, and we can be kind of like the world. We go, well, I really like him. He's very warm and giving, but she's a little edgy. (laughs) But the Bible says right here, he says, if you love those who love you, hey, the pagans do that. If you like those people that like you, hey, the pagans do that. There's nothing glorious in that. What's glorious in the kingdom is that we love people that we wouldn't ordinarily love. You know, sometimes we can get back to kind of a, a high school mentality. You remember, you, remember, you remember in high school how you had all the different lunch tables? Marty, you remember. They had the jock table. They had the cheerleader table. They had the brain table. And then they had the nerds, right? You remember that table? Amen? Okay. Well... You know, sometimes, you know, we can do that in the church, but that's not what the church is supposed to be all about. We're to love one another. We're family. Now, sometimes some of us get a little bit of weak and, and we start to hurt. The, la- the worst thing we can do is because ju- judgmental of that person. They need help. We need to get on in there and help them. Are you with me right here? Because let's face it, and I know this to be the truth, everybody is going to get weak. And maybe you're strong right now. Your day will come. And let me tell you something. What you're going to want on that day is a lot of mercy. Now, we're not going to excuse sin. We call sin out in here at this church. But calling sin out needs to be done with love. I'm just going to ask you a question. Is there anybody here that just kind of, in the fellowship, that bothers you? kind of rubs you the wrong way, kind of grates you like a chalkboard. He just doesn't say it the right way. Maybe in your mind he doesn't have a high enough standard in evangelism. He's weak. He's a remnant person. 
Or maybe not a high enough standard in righteousness. He's not humble. Like me. <laughs> or maybe in your mind doesn't have a deep enough walk with the Lord in prayer. Now, all those things may be true. But the last thing we need is someone in the family being down on somebody. It's when you roll up your sleeves and you say, okay, I'm going to get with that person and I'm going to help them with their righteousness. I'm going to help them with their prayer life. I'm going to help them. And when you do that, there is a love that comes on in. You see, the witness of God's church is our love one for another. That's what Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35. He says, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. I mean, that's what's so great that's happening in this church. We got the white people loving the African-American people. We got the Latin people loving the Asian people. We got the young people loving the old people. We got the poor people loving the rich people. We even got UCLA kids loving USC kids. And who said it couldn't be done? We have got to understand we are a family. And this is the one priority that challenges. Let's get back to the text. Again, in Judges chapter 9, remember? Remember right here that the youngest son, Jotham, escapes. And then we read in verse 6. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gather beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. Oh, for those that have been around the last several weeks, this is a heartbreaking passage. Wow. Shechem. Do you remember all that happened at Shechem? Genesis 12. It was there that Abraham first came to the promised land. God spoke to him and he first built an altar to the Lord. Genesis 35. It was there that Jacob rededicated himself to God and buried his idols underneath the great oak tree. You remember? Joshua chapter 8. It was at Shechem, yes. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal where Joshua gathered all the people, half of them on the Mount of Blessing, Mount Gerizim, and half of them on the Mount of Cursing, Mount Ebal. And there on Mount Ebal, got a bunch of rocks, put plaster on the rocks, and literally wrote out the whole law. And the people said, Amen. And then, you remember the last charge of Joshua. Turn to it, Joshua chapter 24. This is where he says, as for me and my house, at 110 years old, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so after that charge, read in verse 25. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. What do we read here in Judges 9-6? All the citizens of Shechem gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. The very spot that Joshua said, we will always be faithful to God. This stone is a witness how far they had fallen into the darkness. And so we read, verse 7. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them. Can you picture this, guys? Here's this kid. He sees all the people of Shechem and the surrounding countryside. Coming the crown of Bimelech king. And he climbs up to the top of Mount Gerizim. The higher of the mountains. The Mount of Blessing, by the way. And he shouts to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem! So that God may listen to you. 
One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves, and they said to the olive tree, Be our king! But the olive tree answered, Should I give up my oil by which both gods and men are honored? To hold sway over you? Let's think for a second. Remember we talked last week that in fact the Jews were very polytheistic. Now they were monotheistic and they worshipped Jehovah God. But they really were polytheistic. They thought there were gods over each of the other nations. You know, we're monotheistic and we don't think there's any other God out there. And by the way, there isn't. Amen. <laughs> but in that time, they believed there was a God for every nation. And so that's why it says in this little frame, should I give up my oil by which both the gods and men are honored? This way, hold up the trees. Okay, it continues on with this parable. Next, the tree said to the fig tree, come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, should I give my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the tree? Then the tree said to the vine, come and be our king. But the vine answered, should I give up my wine, which shears both the gods and men to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Now, this was a very powerful fable that could be easily understood. Shechem was one of the most fertile areas of all of Israel. And so there you would find the olive tree. There you would find the fig tree. There you would find all of these vines that produce the grapes for the wine. And there on the side of the mountain, the scraggly thorn bushes, or as the King James Version calls them, bramble. Now, the thorn bushes, bramble, is used for kindling wood to get a fire started. It so easily takes fire. And, of course, they're like thin and sharp, prickly. And so right here, he just lays it on out. And, of course, what he's talking about, he says, hey, Gideon was so noble. His sons were so noble. They refused to be king. But you eventually went to the thorn bush, Abimelech. And you anointed him king. He says, therefore, because you've done there, let fire come out of the thorn bush, which is what it was used for, kindling wood, and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Verse 16. Now, this is Jotham talking. Now, if you have acted honestly and in good faith when you made Abimelech king, and if you have been fair to Jeroboam and his family, and if you've treated him as he deserves... And to think that my father fought for you, risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian. But today you've revolted against my father's family, murdered his 70 sons on a single stone, and made Abimelech, the son of his slave girl, king over the citizens of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then you have acted honorably and in good faith toward Jehobel and his family today, may Abimelech be your joy, and may you be his too. But if you have not, Let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. Then Jotham fled, escaping the beer, and he lived there because he was afraid of his brother, Abimelech. Sometimes you have to make a quick exit after a speech like that. Our point, one voice confronts a nation. One voice confronts it. Can you imagine it? He's the only guy that takes a stand for Jehovah God. He climbs up that mountain. He ascends it. And then he says, listen to me. And he flat lays it out. How about it? Have you been so persuaded by this generation of democracy? That whichever way the majority goes, that's what you believe. Or are you willing to be the voice in the darkness that says, thus saith the Lord? How about it? Do you have the guts to climb your Mount Gerizim and speak out at work and say, I believe in Jehovah God and Jesus Christ? Do you have the guts? To stand up at school and say, I believe in Jehovah God and a risen Jesus Christ. You have the guts to stand up in your neighborhood and apartment areas and say, listen, I am a disciple, a born again disciple of Jesus Christ, sold out to his cause. Or do you just passively go along with everything else? You know, I appreciate 
those lone voices that have begun to echo around the world and have said, listen, I am tired of lukewarmness. Jesus is going to be Lord of my life. And I'm willing to challenge a whole fellowship if that fellowship is lukewarm and drifting away. I appreciate Chris Van Staden. He took a stand in Cape Town, South Africa. He says, listen, I believe in lordship. I believe in discipling. I believe in what they're doing out there in the City of Angels Church and in Portland. And he's disfellowshipped. But he's with us today. I appreciate the curtains. They take a stand for discipling and the truth. And they're kicked out of the Montreal church. But they start a new church in Toronto. And the Holy Spirit's now taking them to London. I'm thankful for the Trianas there in Las Vegas. I mean, it was just going to be the two of them. Now, just about seven months later, there are 25 disciples there in Las Vegas that have sold out to the Lord. I think about the Kirsners, who, who in some ways were just baby Christians. One, Sharon just was restored, and Michael just was baptized. I say, hold it. This is not right. And they take a stand. And say, either this changes or we're going to start a new fellowship and go someplace else. That takes a lot of guts. A lot of guts. How much guts do you got? You know, the Bible teaches that when God disciplines his people, he scatters them. But the other thing is, there's a promise that when they begin to return, he gathers them. I mean, isn't this interesting? People that never knew each other. Like Chris Van Staten and the Kernans and Trianas and the Kirshners and the Zindlers. All these people now are being brought together. Is that awesome? Do you see the hand of God working? That is God. And we need to stand back in awe. And to realize God is moving amongst us because we call each other to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can never back down, no matter if the majority is against us, no matter if seemingly everybody's against us, we've got to be willing to be that one voice that confronts a nation. Let's keep on with the story right here. Verse 22, Jotham has fled. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem who acted treacherously against Abimelech. God did this in order that the crime against Jeroboam's 70 sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem, who had helped them murder his brothers. In opposition to him, these citizens of Shechem set men on the hilltops to ambush and rob everyone who passed by, and this was reported to Abimelech. You know, a lot of times we see the darkness, and we go, where is God? Let me tell you something. If you want God to show up, things are going to really happen. God right here waited three years. You know, we want God to just come one day and listen god has his own timing god has his own time it was three years right here and god says enough is enough is enough i am sending one of my cranking evil spirits (laughs) he says i'm putting an evil spirit right down on that guy have you ever felt the attack of an evil spirit they kind of get on you you know you Right there, you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) We've all felt them. See, we think when God comes into his life, it's all blessings and love. (laughs) Angels and doves. No, sometimes he sends an evil spirit right on you. Because he wants you to exaggerate who your sinful flesh is. And to reap what your actions are going to deserve. And so right here, he sends an evil spirit between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem. Kind of interesting, huh? Now watch what happens. Verse 26. Now Gael, son of Ebed, moved with his brothers into Shechem, and its citizens put their confidence in him. So this is a Canaanite guy, okay? After they'd gone out into the fields and gathered the grapes and trotted them, they held a festival in the temple of their god. While they were eating and drinking, they cursed... Abimelech. Okay, so they're worshiping Baal. After all, this whole rebellion was about restoring Baal back to supremacy there for the Canaanite people and the Jewish people. And the Bible says in this worship of Baal, they were eating, they were drinking, they were getting drunk. And of course, 
the looseness of one's lips happens at that time, and they just flat begin to curse Abimelech out loud. Verse 28. Then Gael, son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? Who is Shechem? That we should be subject to him. Isn't E.J. a Baal's son, and isn't Zebul his deputy? Serve the men of Ham or Shechem's father. Why should we serve Abimelech? If only this people were under my command, then I would get rid of him. And I would say to Abimelech, call out your whole army. He drank a lot that day. <laughs> Let's see if we can understand this. Abimelech's seemingly call to power was going to his mother's people, the Canaanites, we'll see they're Hivites, and saying, hey, I'm your brother. But now Gael comes on in and says, hold it. Who's this Abimelech guy? Who's Abimelech? Who's Shechem? It's just another name for Abimelech. That's where he got his power from. Very similar to what Saul said about David. He said, who is David? Who is this son of Jesse? It's a very common biblical expression. It's a repetitious one. But why did he say that? I believe the answer lies for us very forthrightly in Genesis chapter 34. Hold your finger right there. Let's go back and get the history here. In Genesis 34... We find the history of Shechem and Hamor. Verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and violated her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father Hamor, get me this girl as my wife. Well, of course, the sons of Jacob were furious, in particular, Simeon and Levi. And they pretend to say, oh, that'll be great for you to marry my sister and everything. Just one condition. If you're going to marry her, all you guys there have to get circumcised. And so all the men of the land get circumcised. And right after they're circumcised and really hurting, then the sons of Jacob come and slay everybody. And that's why that place was called Shechem. But we need to understand, who was Shechem? Well, his dad was Hamor the Hivite. He's a total Canaanite. And so what is Gael's appeal right here? Verse 28, when Gael son of Ebed said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should be subject to him? Isn't he Jeroboam's son? He says, Isn't he Gideon's boy? And isn't Zebul's deputy another Jewish guy? Serve the men of Hamor, Shechem's father. He says, Don't just have a half-breed Canaanite. We want a full Canaanite government right here. Let's go back all the way to Hamor. That's when it was really awesome, when we had a full Canaanite government. Why should we serve Abimelech, this Jew? He says, I get rid of him. Let's read on. Verse 30. When Zebul, the governor of the city, heard what Gael, son of Abed, said, he was very angry under the covenant. Cover, he sent his messages to Abimelech, saying, Gael, son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem and are stirring up the city against you. Now then, during the night, you and your men should come and lie in wait in the fields. In the morning at sunrise, advance the city. When Gael and his men came out against you, do whatever your hand finds to do. So Abimelech and all of his troops set out by night and took up a concealed position near Shechem in four companies. Now Gael, son of Ebed, had gone out and was standing at the entrance to the city gate, just as Abimelech and his soldiers came out from their hiding place. When Gael saw them, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountain. Zebul replied, You mistake the shadows of the mountain for men. He was just faking it right here, you see. He said, I don't see anything. <laughs> Verse 37. But Gael spoke up again. Look, people are coming down from the center of the land, and the company is coming from the direction of the soothsayer's tree. There's the tree again. Amen, guys? Verse 38. Then Zebul said to him, Where is your big talk now? You who said, who is Abimelech that we should be subject to him? Aren't these the men you ridiculed? Go out and fight them. So Gael led out the citizens of Shechem and fought Abimelech. Abimelech chased him and many fell wounded in flight and all the way to the entrance of the gate. Abimelech stayed in Aramah and Zebul drove out Gael and his brothers out of Shechem. So they get all of the influence out. Now watch this. The next day the people of Shechem went out to the fields and this was reported to Abimelech. So he took his men, divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the field. When he saw the people coming out of the city, he rose to attack them. Abimelech and the companies with him rushed forward to a position at the entrance of the city gate. 
Then two companies rushed upon those in the field and struck them down. All that day, Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered Saul all over it. Not only did he get rid of Gael's influence right there, but he was so ticked off by the people of Shechem because they laid ambush, remember, between him and where he was at. They says, okay, now you're going to pay. Now you're going to pay. And that evil spirit had brought this disharmony on in, and he literally destroys all of Shechem. Remember who Shechem was now. It was all of his people, his mother's people, his mom. He kills everybody. How bad is your anger problem? Is it out of control? Just, just, just simply pull in with criticalness and then sharply come at other people? She says, you aren't fit to worship in that condition. He says, you cannot hate your brother or your wife or husband. You must repent and then you go to worship God. Well, right here, we read in verse 46. On hearing this, the citizens of the town of Shechem went into the stronghold of the temple of Elbereth. When Abimelech heard that they were assembled there, he and all of his men went up to Mount Zalman. He took an axe and cut off some branches, which he lifted to his soldier. He ordered the men with him, quick, do what you've seen me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled him against the stronghold and set on fire over the people inside. So all the people in the town of Shechem, about a thousand men and women, also died. Wow, this guy was out of control. You know, there's a very important principle that Abimelech seizes on right here. Notice what happens here in verse 48. He orders the men with him, quick, do what you've seen me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. He understood the principle of imitation. Now Gideon also understood. Look at Judges, chapter 7, verse 17. Remember when he was trying to rally the 300 against the 135,000? He says, watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all of you are with me, blow our trumpets. Then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. You know, there are certain principles with which God has made, so to speak, the spiritual universe. Discipline is a quality that can be used by evil men or good men. Imitation can be used by evil men or good men. But we need to understand that imitation is something that God has made available to us that we need to put into practice as disciples of Jesus Christ. Our fourth point, one life imitated multiplies. Let's look at some passages on imitation. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Wow, that was the power of the movement of Jesus. Jesus called every single person to have his commitment. And Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You see, we need a flesh and blood example. First of all, that's one of the reasons that Jesus came down is so that we can see God in flesh and blood. But then he went back up and sent his spirit down. Now we need flesh and blood examples of what it means to follow Jesus. And Paul just boldly says, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, one of my favorite songs is, uh, was written by Steve Johnson from the musical Upside Down. Talking about the day of Pentecost. And you remember the 3,000 people get baptized. A little line in the song goes, now there's not just one to kill, but there are 3,000 Jesuses. See, that is the true Christian movement, where every single follower is just as committed as Jesus, they're willing to die for the cause. That's the power of imitation. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 14, I think we all know the church in Corinth had a few problems. That's an understatement. But Paul had a way to fix the problems. Let's see. Verse 14, he writes them. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. 
Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He'll remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. This is kind of funny. Paul says, listen, Corinthian church, I'm your father in faith. You have 10,000 guardians. Some people think that the church had reached 10,000 disciples at that point because we are a brother's keeper. Amen, church? Amen. And he says, I'm very concerned about you. He says, here's the solution to your problems. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, oh, yeah, the way you're going to do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send my trusty sidekick, Timothy, to you, into you. Notice Timothy didn't have to interview. There was no interview process. It wasn't a matter of, hey, do you like the guy or not? Paul says, I'm sending this guy on in so you have someone to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Amen. He's such a good imitation of me that you'll be able to imitate Christ through him and deal with your problems. Is that pretty awesome? Amen. He says, as a matter of fact, this is what I teach everywhere in every church. You see, the way that you get churches to come together is you've got to call upon imitation. There's got to be an imitation of the same level of commitment. Are you with me right here? There's got to be a leadership that calls the people to imitate Christ. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. One life imitated multiplies. 1 Thessalonians 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he's chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Now, we remember from Acts chapter 17 that it was Paul, Silas, and Timothy who started the church there. Amen? They only spent three Sabbath days. They were only there three weeks. And that's the only record that we have of them visiting. And yet look what he's saying to them. He says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. Verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with great joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers of Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Well, you know, for a lot of people, they, don't, they would not like, number one, the word imitation. I hope you're comfortable with the word imitation because it's in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible and you're called to imitate, you got to start asking, you, who are you imitating? Paul says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Now, a lot of people are going, now, Paul, that's just, you got to put the Lord first. <laughs> no. He says, you became imitators of us, and that way you became an imitator of the Lord. You see what I'm talking about right here? Now, it is very interesting. I think in the past, we, we had some semblance of imitation. But our fixation, I think, upon individual leaders kind of hurt this principle. Notice right here, he says, you became imitators of us. Well, who's the us? It's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. He says, there was something different about Silas to be imitated, something different about Timothy to be imitated, and something different about Paul to be imitated. And you've got to ask yourself, who are you imitating to grow in Christ? Now, I remember when I was... Uh, a young preacher. I wanted to be able to preach the best I could. And so I, I, I looked upon who I thought were the great preachers. And so I wanted to imitate them. Well, one of the guys that baptized me was Chuck Lucas. I wanted to imitate him. Another guy was amazing, Richard Rogers. I wanted to imitate him. And then I had people in the secular world like John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. I go, man, those guys crank. And I tried to imitate. And over time, you evolve into your own style. But you've got to ask yourself, who are you imitating? In their faith, in their life, in their love, in their counseling, in their discipling, in their discipline, in their impact. Who, who are you really going after? See, to imitate someone is to be humble. It's tough to say, listen, you've got this on better than me. I need to learn from you. So that's what discipleship's all about. The word disciple means student. Who are you a student of? Who are you learning from? Are you with me right here, guys? Then he says, in verse 7, And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. What's cool right here is the Thessalonian church, even though he was only there three weeks, he 
and Silas and Timothy were a model to the believers, they imitated so awesomely that the church became a model to all the other churches in Macedonia and Achaia. That is cranking right there. As a matter of fact, he says, your faith in God has become known everywhere. You know, we've, we've got to really ask ourselves, do we believe in the principle of imitation? Yep. If we do, then let's put it into practice. Amen, guys? Amen. Let's finish up our story. In the book of Judges, chapter 9. Verse 50. Next, Abimelech went to Thebes and besieged it and captured it. Inside the city, however, was a strong tower to which all the men and women, all the people of the city fled. They locked themselves in and climbed up on the tower roof. Gosh, sounds about the same as what happened in Shechem, doesn't it? Abimelech went to the tower and stormed it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. Hurriedly, he called to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me. So they can't say, a woman killed him. So his servant ran him through, and he died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. God also made the men of Sechem pay for all of their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam, came on them all. Our last point. The one God will not be mocked. The one God will not be mocked. Right here, look for a while, Abimelech was going to get away with it. Right here, look for a while, the men of Shechem was going to get away with it. But the curse of Jotham, the one voice, resounded loud. And God brought about their destruction. Our final scripture, Galatians 6. In verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his simple nature from the nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You know, the Bible says right here, God is going to judge your life. And you got two options at the end of your life. Either you're going to get the eternal crown of glory, like Paul talked about, or you're going to get a millstone. You're going to get crowned one way or the other. <laughs> one crown will be in heaven, and the other crown will be in hell. But God will not be mocked. He knows what's going on in your life. Oh, maybe you don't. Maybe other people don't know. Maybe, maybe your roommates don't know. Maybe your friends don't know. Maybe nobody in your family knows. But God will not be mocked. He knows what's going on in your life. And he says, what you sow, you will reap. You know, someone that I love with all my heart, more than any other human person, is, is Elena. And uh, on August 8th this week, she's going to celebrate her 34th spiritual birthday. Wow. That's cranking right there. And, uh, you know, what's, what's been awesome is uh, uh, coming down here to Los Angeles has not been Elena's greatest and highest joy. But, you know, she's come down because she believed God was not only sending me, but sending her. And you got to believe that if you're husband and wife. You know, it's not just God that leads your husband. It's both of you. Amen? And I really appreciate the, the, the guts that Elena's had in laying down her life. Because there's, there's a great deal of sadness that surrounds some of the places that she looks in this city. There's, there's a great deal of sadness when she thinks about old relationships that are no longer intact. There's, there's a great deal of sadness when, when she sees how many hurting people there are out there. And you know something? There is so much pain out there. And in the lives of some who even call themselves disciples. Or at least were disciples. And yet what I appreciate about her 
is every morning she's in her Bible. Every morning she's on her knees. And she gets her strength from the Lord to be able to deny herself that day. And you look around the room and, and you're beginning to see the one life imitated does multiply. And I, and I appreciate so much this total denial of self to do the will of God. Because the one God will not be mocked. You know, many of us are going to the Jubilee this next week. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Amen, guys? Matter of fact, there are over a hundred of us going. And I believe this can be the most life-changing week so far in your Christian life. But decisions have got to be made. Because one decision leads to another decision. Just like Gideon. And so decisions this week need to be made for some of you just to get baptized. Some of you just need to say, listen, i got to return my cell phone in and get restored. Enough of this flailing around in the world right here. Some of you need to say, you know something? I've been hurting, but it's time to deny myself. It's time for me to start using my talents and step back into leadership, even though I'm a little bit fearful of the challenges they're in. And some of you need to say, listen, you know something? I just want to be a leader. I, I, I am going to put before the Lord whether or not it's God's will for me to be full-time in the ministry. One of two crowns awaits. The millstone or the crown of glory. It's your choice. I pray that you do not share the curse of King Abimelech. Thanks and God bless.